Let's open our Bibles this morning to the book of Deuteronomy in the Old Testament, chapter 9. Deuteronomy is the fifth book in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 9 through 12, Reviewing Important Laws. Israel has been brought out of bondage in Egypt. Because of unbelief, they refused to go into the land because they were afraid of the giants in the land of Canaan, modern-day Israel. And because of that, God turned them back into the wilderness for another 38 years until every man, 20 years and over, who refused to go into the land, dies because God will not allow us to inherit his blessings through unbelief. Now that generation has died. There are only two men out of all of the 600 and some odd thousand men, plus women and children, who are going to be allowed to go into the land, only two men of faith, Joshua and Caleb. Moses himself is discounted. He had faith to enter the land, but he did not have faith to execute God's command to speak to the rock and bring forth water. And in anger, he took his rod and struck it twice and said, must I provide water for you, you rebels? And so he took the place of God and the work of God upon himself and dishonored God. So he is discounted. Aaron, his brother, is already dead. He also had been angry on that occasion. So only two men are going to make it. Now, God is getting the next generation ready, and he's having Moses retell the law. The first time it was written down on two tablets of stone and other parchments we can presume, but this time it's a telling. It's an oral telling to the next generation of what God wants. And it's an example to us that we must tell every generation about the Lord and what he wants from us and what he's going to do for us. And that's why you teach your children and your grandchildren and your nieces and your nephews to the best of your ability about God. Try to get them into daily devotions. We're working with these kids downstairs right now in Sunday school. And that is the most wonderful privilege we have of teaching these young ones about the Lord. So he's reviewing the law, and we're going to see in chapter 9 how he talks about Israel's rebellions. I think it's important to tell the next generation not only how God has blessed us and how we have been obedient to God, but also how we missed it and how we had consequences, because they need to learn by negative examples as well as positive. And I don't know about your upbringing, but in the world that I lived in and all the world I could see, we had basically sinful kids and sinless parents. Kids who messed up and parents who never made a mistake. Or at least, well, it's kind of like our politicians, God bless them, don't you know? Uh, there's never a politician who's wrong. Uh, the words, I am sorry, don't come out of their mouths at all, and not really out of parents' mouths too much. I don't think parents need to get too graphic, but I think parents need to teach by example, I messed up. And this is what I did wrong. And God was able to turn things around. Don't make the same mistake. So we're going to learn about the rebellions of Israel. Chapter 10, we're going to talk about how Moses reviews the essence of the law, the Ten Commandments. And we're going to see in chapter 11 the blessings of loving God and obeying Him. They go together. And then chapter 12, how he's going to talk about worship the chosen way of worship, and the forbidden way of worship. As always, we need God's help, don't we? Father, we thank you for this chance to study your word. Help us to understand it and literally be changed by it. For we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Chapter 9, let's talk about the uh, rebellions. Moses is going to tell Israel about the fact that They're going to inherit this land of Canaan, not because they're righteous, but because the Canaanites have been wicked. And God also made a promise to their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that they would get the land. Let's remember, too, that the blessings that come upon us are not because of our righteousness, but the righteousness we have by faith in Jesus Christ. He's going to show their rebellious history. He'll talk about that golden calf incident, which was very unfortunate, and other incidents of complaining and rebellion and how Moses had to intercede. I think the lesson, for me at least, in chapter 9 is our salvation 
and our works for God after our salvation are only by God's grace, not our righteousness. So let's begin with chapter 9 and verse 1. They're on the eastern side of the Jordan River in what is today modern-day Jordan, and they're getting their marching orders, so to speak, and before they do, they need to know who they are, who God is, what He expects of them, and what He's going to do for them. Hear, O Israel, you are to cross over the Jordan today and go in to dispossess nations greater and mightier than yourself, cities great and fortified up to heaven, a people great and tall, the descendants of the Anakim, whom you know and of whom you heard it said, you can stand, who can stand before the descendants of Anak? Therefore understand today that the Lord your God is he who goes over before you as a consuming fire. That's well worth underlining, a consuming fire. He will destroy them and bring them down before you, so you shall drive them out and destroy them quickly, as the Lord has said to you. God is making a promise. I'm going to give you victory in the land, victory over the giants. Well, we think about giants, and we think about giants in our own terminology and our own times. We know about basketball players who are seven foot two, and we talk about somebody who was seven foot nine. We talked about one of the kings that they had already defeated on the eastern side. His bed was 13 feet long and six feet wide. That's a giant. And they were absolutely petrified. And when you and I think about the challenges of life, it might not be a literal giant, but aren't there giants in our lives? People are in great fear about finances, not enough money, physical problems, cancer, diabetes, blindness, other kinds of things, relationships that are very strained. We have a very mobile generation now all over the world, not just here. And so there are many parents who have to take their kids elsewhere and the grandparents don't know them or only see them once a year. And everything is very, very different today. Uh, relationships get to be a problem. And so in every area of our lives, there are giants. But as you trust in the Lord, he will give you the land. He'll give you the victory, the blessing, no matter what it might be. And he says here, I'll go before you as a consuming fire. John the Baptist said about Jesus when he first introduced him, he said, I baptize with water, but the one who comes after me, that's Jesus, will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. God uses fire in several ways. For the unbeliever, it's going to be the ultimate torture in the lake of fire forever and ever in Gehenna, the Greek word for it. And that's the eternal destination of those that don't know and love the Lord. But for the believer, God's going to also use that fire. He's going to use it in our lives to burn out of us that which is not of God, burn out of us the sin in our lives as he would put gold in the fire to separate the gold from the dross. He'll also use fire in heaven at the judgment seat of Christ for believers. There, all of our works will be put into that fire to see what they're made of. And so when Pastor Jerry goes to the hospital to visit the sick, that'll be examined and put in the fire. Is that going to be commendable? We'll have to wait and see. If it was done with a pure heart, with glory to God, and by God's obedience, I'll be rewarded. If it was done because I think I have to, to earn a paycheck, and I'm begrudging, and I'm looking at my clock and want to get in and out and hope the person is maybe asleep or down getting an x-ray, I will lose that reward. And so how it's going to be for all of us, motive, and who has directed those works, all part of what God's going to do. All right, now he goes on to say, verse 4, do not think in your heart after the Lord your God has cast them out before you, saying, because of my righteousness, the Lord has brought me in to possess this land. But it's because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord is driving them out before you. It's not because of your righteousness or the uprightness of your heart that you'll go in to possess the land, but because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord your God drives them out from before you, and he may fulfill the word which the Lord swore to the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Therefore understand the Lord your God has not given you this good land to possess because of your righteousness, 
for you are a stiff-necked people. Now you'll notice already in this passage, repetition. He's made that comment at least three times in just a few verses about your righteousness. But he's speaking to them not reading to them. When you give somebody a written document, you don't need to repeat yourself. Uh, but when you are speaking, repetition is important. And uh, even sometimes in writing, there's an old newspaper adage for the reporters, tell them what you're going to tell them. Tell them, and then tell them what you told them. And certainly that applies in speech as well. So it's not your righteousness. Now in my life it's different because when I get blessings it's because I pray and I study God's Word and I'm more diligent than many people and I'm better looking than some people and because I work harder and on and on and on that righteousness is due to my particular work right not at all not at all the righteousness of man apart from God is as Isaiah says like filthy rags before God and not to be indelicate but the literal translation is menstrual rags. That's what God thinks of our righteousness. And the Bible says there is none righteous, no, not one. The only righteousness that we can have is the righteousness by faith in Jesus Christ. Paul said to the Roman church, he was delivered up because of our offenses. And he was raised up because of our justification or our righteousness. Our sins put Jesus on the cross. God raised him to show that our sins were forgiven. And as we have given our sins to Christ by faith, he has given us his righteousness by faith. So next time we think it's because we're doing a lot, no. The only righteousness that God looks at is Jesus. Is Jesus in your hearts? Then you have righteousness. And the good works that we do, that's important to show the love that we have for him and the ability to listen to what he wants to do. But it doesn't make us righteous. Praying twice as much, studying the Bible, doesn't make you any more righteous. You have all the righteousness you need, all the righteousness that's required, all the righteousness there is, the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Remember verse 7. Don't forget how you provoked the Lord your God to wrath in the wilderness from the day that you departed from the land of Egypt until you came to this place. You have been rebellious against the Lord. So he's now going to talk about their nature. Not only are you not righteous, you are rebellious. And the old nature is rebellious. Also in Oreb or Mount Sinai, you provoked the Lord to wrath. So the Lord was angry enough with you to destroy you. I went up on the mountain to receive the tablets of stone, the tablets of the covenant which the Lord made with you. I stayed on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. I neither ate bread nor drank water. Then the Lord delivered to me two tablets of stone, written with the finger of God, and on them all the words which the Lord had spoken to you on the mountain from the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. It came to pass at the end of forty days and forty nights, the Lord gave me the two tablets of stone, the tablets of the covenant. The Lord said to me, Arise, go down quickly from here, for your people whom you brought out of Egypt have acted corruptly. They have quickly turned aside from the way which I commanded them. They have made themselves a molded image. Notice the word your. God and Moses will batter that back and forth kind of like a tennis ball. When God is angry with them, he'll say they're your people. When Moses stands up to God, he says they're your people. Now, it's not just when they're angry, but in a sense, God does see them as belonging to the shepherd and the shepherd certainly sees them as belonging to God. As a pastor, I see that those that come in the door are, by God's grace, my responsibility, whether it's one time they come or they stay for years. And I'm to look to the Lord and pray for them. As somebody leaves, I want to know about it, pray for them, and release them into another shepherd's hands. At the same time, I realize they don't belong to me. They belong to God. Think of that also with your children because they're God's gift to you, but they're only being lent to you. That's why we have a dedication service, to let everybody know they really belong to God. And when they're starting to act up, then uh, you put them on the altar, or as Bud said at Tuesday night prayer meeting, I've been using it a lot, Bud, since then, put them in God's inbox. He has a big inbox. And put those kids, and if they start to get that foot out or that hand, shove them back in and slam that door tight. And don't go near it, because that inbox 
has no key to get back in again, okay? Anyway, you've been rebellious. We gave, I, I came down, what did I notice? Verse 13, the Lord said, uh, I have seen this people, they're stiff-necked. You know what stiff-necked is, don't you? They just rear back. I'm, uh, I've, I've got a new job now, I'm a puppy walker, and I've got an eight to nine week old Samoya that I'm walking, and nobody had to teach that little fellow about a stiff neck. Uh, when he has to go back into the house and upstairs into his cage, he has understood the definition of stiff necked. Took him out this morning, he was happy to come down, go back up into that cage, he rears back, and I had to drag him all 13 pounds of him, and let him know that he wasn't even alive nine weeks ago, and I know more than he does. At least I think I do. Anyway, stiff-necked, that's how they were. Let me alone, verse 14, that I may destroy them, God says. I want to blot out their name from under heaven. I'll make of you a nation mightier and greater than they. So God says, I'll start all over again. What a nice invitation, huh? So I turned and came down from the mountain, the mountain that burned with fire, with the two tablets of the covenant in my hands, I looked and behold, you had sinned against the Lord your God, had made for yourselves a molded calf. You turned aside quickly from the way which the Lord had commanded them. I took the two tablets of stone, threw them out of my hands, and broke them before your eyes. And I fell down before the Lord as at the first, forty days and forty nights. I neither ate bread nor drank water because of all of your sin which you committed in doing in wickedly in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger." I was afraid of the anger and hot displeasure which the Lord was angry with you with to destroy you. But the Lord listened to me at that time. Here's his intercession. The Lord was very angry with Aaron and would have destroyed him. So I prayed for Aaron also at the same time. Then I took your sin, the calf which you had made, burned it with fire, crushed it, ground it with fire, or ground it very small until it was fine as dust. I threw its dust into the brook that descended from the mountain." So God said, go on down and see those people of yours. Here Moses has been fasting 40 days and 40 nights. Nobody else in history, as recorded by the Bible, had fasted that long except for Jesus, many years in the future, 1,500 years down the road. So the poor guy comes down. He's got the two tablets of stone. He's probably a little bit weak, I would think, after that many days of no water and no food. And he sees that Aaron, his brother, had succumbed to the pressure of the people and had made a golden calf so they could bow down and worship and say, this is the God who led us out of Egypt. So they're violating the commandments which they knew about. Thou shalt not make any carved image of anything in heaven or the earth or the sea. So already they're breaking the commandments. So Moses in anger takes the tablets of stone and breaks them. Now, I was just thinking about something. He's angry with them. He grinds up this uh, calf makes them drink it, drink their own sin. Do you think he sat down for a good full meal to get refreshed after those 40 days and 40 nights? I don't think so. I think he had such anger anyway, he went right back up on that mountain and another 40 days and 40 nights. That puts him twice as far as Jesus did. He had to be one hungry fellow. In any event, when God does help you in fasting, you are sustained. But he is really having to prostrate himself before God. He's an intercessor. He has a wonderful heart for intercession. But who gave him that heart? We look at how God works in people's lives and brings forth fruit. We see compassion developing, mercy, intercession. Where do those qualities come from? They come from God. Anybody who's been in the Lord for a long time knows the old nature is not compassionate. It does not want to intercede, but the new nature does. Let the new nature come forth. So. That was the, the golden calf incident. Verse 22, here are two more. At Taborah, at Masa, in Kibroth Hatava, you provoked the Lord to wrath. At Tabera, or Tabera, they were uh, just complaining in general about their lot in life. Then there was Masa, I think that was water, and uh, uh, Kibroth Hatava was food. They were tired of the manna that God gave. And so God gave them quail until it came out of their nostrils. And they had to eat it morning, noon, and night, and he ended up killing a large number of them. Watch out for complaining. A complaining spirit. Complaining is ultimately against God. When you and I complain, it's music to the devil's ears. Oh, he loves to know that his God's people are not happy with him. But 
For God, it makes them angry. What we're saying is, God, you're not doing a good job, and I'm unhappy with you. We don't really want to say that, but that's what's coming out. So what did Moses do now? God wanted to really destroy them. I prostrated myself before the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. I kept prostrating myself because the Lord had said he would destroy you. And I prayed to the Lord. And look at this beautiful prayer. O Lord God, do not destroy your people and your inheritance, whom you have redeemed through your greatness, whom you have brought out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Notice the word you and your. He's putting these people right before God. They belong to you. Remind God that these are his people. He knows it, but we need to know it. Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So don't destroy these people because, first of all, they're yours. Second of all, you made a promise to our fathers to give us this land, and these people have to enter this land to fulfill that promise. So don't look on the stubbornness of the people, lest the land from which you brought us would say, and here's the third reason, Because the Lord was not able to bring them to the land which he promised them, and because he hated them, he has brought them out to kill them in the wilderness. Yet they are your people and your inheritance, whom you brought out by your mighty power and by your outstretched arm. So number one, don't destroy these people because they belong to you. Number two, don't destroy them because you promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to take these same people into the land. Number three, This will be a bad reputation for you, God, because Egypt is going to say he delivered them and then he got angry and killed them. What was that all about? It's going to be an embarrassing blot on your name, God. Finally, they're yours and they're your inheritance. You take care of them. That is really putting them on the altar, putting them in God's inbox. If you and I will do that, not necessarily involved with the God wanting to destroy the people. He doesn't want to destroy us. But when you're wrestling with something or someone, put that person on the altar. My mother and I did not get along for a number of years when I was in the practice of law. We didn't even talk for some time. And um, mother had really had trouble with me. And uh, she had talked to my younger brother, who was the first one saved. And he said, put Jerry in the box. Put the box on the altar. Put the lid on the box. If his hand flops out, Gently put it back in again and walk away. She did that in the uh, Father's Day of uh, 1977. She was at my house for dinner, mentioned God. She was now born again. I was not, and I said, don't mention God in my house ever again. And um, that was it. That was July. Following April, I came to the Lord and uh, walked with him. She and I got reconciled and went on to do a fine work for the Lord by God's grace, not our own. So put that person on the altar. The Lord showed me this analogy many years ago, and you can adapt it whatever way you want, but you and the Lord are in a rowboat in the middle of the lake, and the Lord's going to watch to see what you're going to do. Grab the oars and watch the boat go nowhere, or give the oars to him and let him take you right where he wants to go. You and I need to get our hands off the altar, the, the oars, or horse and carriage, you got the reins, give the reins to him, whatever. Don't take this ridiculous statement that I heard when I was young. God is my co-pilot. If God's my co-pilot, we're in deep trouble because I'm the one that's driving the plane. So don't make, you sit over and be a co-pilot and and watch him and let him be the one that takes care of that plane. All right, so chapter 10. He's now reviewing the essence of the law and he tells how he rewrote the Ten Commandments. And then he expands on the law's essence The real essence of the law, 613 laws condensed into one primarily, loving God, and because of that, loving fellow man. Jesus said, Matthew 22, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Everything in your being should love him. Chapter 10, at that time, the Lord said to me, hew for yourself two tablets of stone like the first. Come up to me on the mountain and make yourself an ark of wood. And I'll write on the tablets the words on the first tablets, which you broke, and you'll put them in the ark. So I made an ark of acacia wood, hewed two tablets of stone like the first, went up to the mountain, having the two tablets in my hand. Interesting question, and we don't have any answer for it. Those are the best kind, right? Do you think his anger was justified? Moses was justified in breaking those tablets? We don't know for sure. 
Um, there is such a thing as righteous anger, righteous indignation. In his mind, he broke the tablets because they had broken the law already by the time he had come down. And I don't know if it was of God that he break those tablets or not. Probably a lot of self-passion in there as well. But it was anger because it was for God's sake. And that's a very delicate thing to find. When I get angry, is it because of righteous indignation or because of selfish anger? My personal guess, a bit of both on his part. Righteous indignation and uh, self-anger as he displayed on another occasion with the striking of the rock. We're all human. We make those mistakes. Uh, in any event, when you lose your temper, guess what? You've got to make those tablets all over again. If you struggle with anger, if you struggle with temper, uh, you do a lot of damage, and it takes a lot of damage control to get things back again. And I've had to battle a temper all my life, and uh, I, uh, my great-grandfather from Tennessee was like that too. He would talk to an operator. If he didn't like the way she talked, he'd yank that phone right off the wall. Then he'd send her flowers and candy to make her, make her happy there. It's, it's a lot of damage. You get, get the anger under control. In any event... <laughs> You know, there's grace with God, but it makes extra work, extra work for God, extra work for him, and another 40 days of fasting, and who needs that, right? So in any event, they're made all over again, and um, it's, uh, he's talking about their journey, and uh, it says, uh, verse 8, that the Lord separated the tribe of Levi. Remember, he's telling the new generation all of this, so they are up to speed on what's going on. Uh, he's telling them that Levi has no land, verse 9, no inheritance in the land, um, because God wants for them to be supported by the people, even as in most cases, God wants his apostles and prophets and pastor teachers, evangelists to be supported by the work of the Lord. Jesus himself was supported by those who helped him, including the women who followed in his band, and so their labor is worthy of his hire. Now, the essence of the law, verse 12, this is so important. 613 laws, and we're going to cover them, and we are covering them over many weeks, but that can make you glaze over, can't it? So you need to get it summarized. And we like the bottom line, or the Reader's Digest version. All right, what does the Lord your God require of you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command you today for your good. Remember this, God's commandments are for our good. I don't always like his commandments. I find his commandments restrictive, like that little puppy today that didn't want to go back into that cage. He didn't like my action of having to put him back in that cage. I don't blame him, but it was for his good. And so uh, we need to make sure we know these commandments are good, and we need to just trust God in that situation. Uh, verse 15, the Lord delighted only in your fathers to love them. He chose their descendants after them. You above all peoples as it is this day. Chosen by God. So circumcise the foreskin of your heart and be stiff-necked no longer. That's two ways in two metaphors of saying the same thing. We know about the circumcision of the foreskin of the young child's penis on the eighth day that just cuts away the flesh. It's a, it's a picture really also of cutting away the fleshly sinful side of our hearts. Lord, circumcise my heart that it might be devoted only to you. May I not be stiff-necked, saying the same thing. The Lord your God is a God is the God of gods, the Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality nor takes a bribe. He administers justice for the fatherless and the widow, loves the stranger, giving him food and clothing. Remember, we don't stand back and say, how nice for you, God, that you favor the fatherless, the widow, and the stranger. God says, guess what? If that's how I feel, that's how you feel. If I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it through you. So I need to watch out for the fatherless. I need to watch out for the widows. And incidentally, there are many cases today where a widow is somebody who might be a divorcee and she does not have anybody to support her. I have situations like that as well. There are kids who are fatherless. Their kids may be, the fathers are alive, but they don't come around. And so we need to be looking out for those who are in need. Strangers, not just those from other nations. Anybody around you is a stranger until you get to know them and make them a friend. So be out there to 
do what you can to help them. Verse 20, fear the Lord your God, serve him, take hold fast to what he has. He's your praise, he's your God who has done for you these great things and awesome things which your eyes have seen. Your fathers went down to Egypt with 70 persons, and now the Lord your God has made you as the stars of heaven in multitude. They're probably close to 3 million people now, all from the original 70, or actually elsewhere it says 75 people. Chapter 11, let's get down to the uh, essence really about love and obedience. And um, he says now in chapter 11, Moses commands love of God for his deeds, his great deeds, and obedience to his command for success in the land. If you want to live long in the land, you do what he tells you to do. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. We don't have any excuse in the New Testament to say, we're not under the law, we're under grace. We're under... Now remember this too, in the Old Testament or in the New Testament, Keeping the law does not make us righteous. We talked about that already. We don't get to heaven based on the law. And yet for those who don't come to God through Jesus, they're really trying to have a works righteousness relationship with God. If you were to ask of the 7 billion people in this world, 2 out of 7 billion claim to be Christians. The rest don't even claim to be Christians. Out of the 2 billion, I doubt that there's more than maybe 10, 20% at most from this country that really are born again. Most of them are just nominal. How are they getting to heaven? Based on righteousness of their works. But again, we said that our righteousness is his filthy rags before God. Now, salvation's by grace. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 say, by grace you've been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Salvation's by grace and by faith, but then we are saved to serve. He says we are his workmanship. Poema in the Greek, our poem, a work of art. You're his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he has prepared beforehand for you to do, to walk in. So we're saved by grace, we're saved to work. But work does not get us into heaven. Jesus gets us into heaven. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except by me. So we now look at uh, love and obedience, and they are one and the same. There used to be a song when I was young called Love and Marriage Go Together Like a Horse and Carriage. That may be, but it's really love and obedience which is going to be necessary for relating to God and relating to other people. Therefore, verse 1 of chapter 11, you shall love the Lord your God and keep his charge, his statutes, his judgments, and his commandments always. Know today that I do not speak with your children who have not known and who have not seen the chastening of the Lord your God, his greatness and his mighty hand, his outstretched arm, his signs, his acts, which he did in the midst of Egypt to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all his land. What he did to the army of Egypt, the horses, the chariots, how he made the waters of the Red Sea overflow them as they pursued you, and how the Lord has destroyed them to this day. What he did for you in the wilderness until you came to this place. What he did to those rebels, Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, the son of Reuben. How the earth opened up its mouth and swallowed them up, their households, their tents, and all the substance in their possession. Your eyes have seen every great act of the Lord which he did. Therefore you shall keep every commandment which I command you today, that you may be strong and go in and possess the land which you cross over to possess. And you may prolong your days in the land which the Lord swore to give your fathers to them, their descendants, a land flowing with milk and honey. The land which you go to possess is not like the land of Egypt, from which you have come, where you sowed your seed and watered it by foot as a vegetable garden. But the land which you cross over to possess is a land of hills and valleys, which drinks water from the rain of heaven, a land for which the Lord your God cares. The eyes of the Lord your God are always on it from the beginning of the year to the very end of the year. So here he's talking about all the great acts which he has done. I'm not talking to your kids who haven't seen these things. I'm talking to you. You saw these things, he said. And I delivered you from Egypt, and I took care of those rebels, Dathan and Abiram, who opposed the uh, priesthood of Aaron. 
and I've got a land for you, and you're going to have to be obedient to possess the land. That's a critical thing for us as well. I want all the blessings that God has for me. I want to possess all the land which he has for me, but I don't want to do what he has to say. And uh, it's kind of like marriage. The husband says to the wife, I want all the pleasures of marriage, and I want all the comforts of marriage, and I want the freedom to come and go and find other playmates and have fun, but I still expect for this to be a blessed marriage and you to do your part. Well, the divorce courts have had a lot to say about that, haven't they, huh? And uh, it just doesn't work. It just does not work. Or your boss. I expect you to pay me and what have you, but I'll come when I want and go when I want and do what I want and badmouth you when I want to. Uh, most bosses are not terribly open to that idea. So obedience is going to be necessary for a blessing. And this new land is not like you had in Egypt. In Egypt, the Nile River would overflow and they had to have irrigation ducts and systems to be able to get the water to get the crops going. This will be two rains, the early rain and the latter rain. It's going to rain down from heaven right on this beautiful land, which I'm going to give you. Verse 13, If you earnestly obey my commandments, which I command you today, to love the Lord your God and serve him with all your heart, with all your soul, I'll give you the rain for your land in its season, the early rain, the latter rain, that you may gather in your grain, new wine and oil. I'll send grass in your fields for your livestock that you may eat and be filled. Take heed to yourselves, lest your heart be deceived and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. Lest the Lord's anger be aroused against you and he shut up the heavens so there be no rain and the land yield no produce and you perish quickly from the good land which the Lord has given you. Does that apply today? You don't put God first, there'll be no blessing. Oh, there are people that don't know the Lord who are wealthy and they have a lot of success in the world's eyes. But the psalmist struggled with that in Psalm 73. We all struggle. You know, I love you, Lord, and I don't have a whole lot of extra money, and I don't have a whole lot of extra this or that. And the guy across the street doesn't love you. He's an avowed agnostic or an atheist. And oh, he's blessed. He's driving three cars and blah, blah, blah. And the other person seems more blessed than you. The psalmist struggled with that. Does it really pay to serve the Lord when the unrighteous seem to be so blessed? And then halfway through the psalm, he says, I then went into the sanctuary and I saw their end. They are on a slippery slope and there's no one who can bring them back because we're not just talking about time, we're talking about eternity. Where will they spend eternity? With the Lord or not? And so obedience is necessary. And uh, he says uh, also about this matter of rain, or crops, or what have you. Uh, I'll use that again in the future. Not just in the Old Testament, not just for the church age. I'm going to use that in the millennium. So in the millennium, the prophet tells us that all people will go to Israel to worship at the foot of the king, the Lord Jesus, in Jerusalem. And if they do not, guess what? He is going to withhold the rain on their land. They will have no crops, and they will starve. You and I, if we are in Christ, will be here during the millennium. We're going to help the Lord Jesus rule and reign over people in their natural bodies while we are in our resurrection bodies. And I think we're going to be largely police officers for him. And I think we're going to be rounding people up to get over there to Jerusalem because they're going to want to have rain and want to eat and what have you. We're going to have to help impose his rule. It's not going to be a rule of just love Jesus and grace and what have you. It's going to be a ruling with a rod of iron on his part, and you and I will be a part of that. So um, you may have to go to police academy somewhere in the way to get back down here to help him do that. Rather an interesting and odd view of our role in the millennium. Well, in any event, we're going to have to make sure that we keep the law in our hearts as they were told to do. Uh, verse 18 you shall lay up these words of mine in your heart, in your soul. Bind them as a sign in your hand. They shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You'll teach them to your children, speaking of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates, that your days and the days of your children may be multiplied in the land of which the Lord swore to your fathers to give them, like the days of the heavens above the earth." You are to keep my law and you are to teach it 
to your children. He talks about the law. We saw this before. You're going to bind the law as a sign on your hand. Orthodox Jews take a little black leather box with three scriptures in it. They have long straps. They put it on the left upper arm and they wrap it with the two fingers and the thumb in a certain way. And they think that that is what is required here to have the law on their hand. They'll then take another little box and as far as the frontlets between your eyes, they put that box in their forehead. They take the straps in a certain way, wrap it around their head. They will then take a little portion of the law with a little plate, uh, the mezuzah, and they're going to put that on the door of their house. And if they have enough room, they're going to tilt that little mezuzah toward the room itself. And they're going to walk by that when they go out or they go in. They will put their, their fingers to their lips and touch it and keep the law on their hand, their head, and the doorposts. They do it literally. I do not criticize that. I do not think that's what God intended. If you think it is and you want to do that, I used to have the uh, phylacteries. I long since have lost them. My father was an Orthodox Jew, or my stepfather was, and I had those and they've gotten lost over the years. I don't see any problem with that uh, if it's something you, you know to release your faith toward the reality. But the reality is not, I'm keeping God's law by putting this on my arm or my forehead or the door. My hand will be used to do the work of God. The Lord's word is in my mind. May his word be governing this house in which I live. That's what he's talking about. He's talking not about the literal, but about the symbolic. As we had communion this morning, I don't see that literally as the body of Jesus Christ. This is the body. No, it's a cracker representing the body. I don't see the cup as the blood, but representing the blood. I don't see the oil as literally the power of the Holy Spirit. It's a symbol. And so we use symbols all of the time. But make sure that the reality is there. And if you need a symbol, if you need something physical to remind you of the reality, I don't see any problem with that, so long as the symbol itself does not become a ritual. If the symbol becomes a reality, that's not right. That's why God said, no carved image of anything in heaven or earth. I'm bigger than your understanding of me. Keep me in your heart. Verse 22, keep all these commandments which I command. Love the Lord your God. Walk in his ways. Hold fast to him. And the Lord's going to drive out all these nations from before you. And you will dispossess greater and mightier nations than yourselves. Every place on which the sole of your foot treads shall be yours. From the wilderness and Lebanon, from the river, the river Euphrates, even to the western sea shall be your territory. When Joshua leads Israel into the land, he is going to be told how to move forward to take the land. And every place where they place their foot as they trust in God is going to be theirs. From the wilderness, that's down in the Arabah in the south, to Lebanon in the north, from the river Euphrates over in modern day Iraq on the east, all the way to the Mediterranean. Now that's far more land than they have now. But that land is going to be theirs and that's the land that was promised to Abraham. Not the land they have right now. This is a puny portion of it. But the land that's going to be coming through Jesus Christ will fulfill these borders. Verse 26, I set before you today a blessing and a curse. God makes it very simple. How many of you have had children? Did you ever have uh, either verbally or in writing do's and don'ts? Do this and you get blessings. Do that and you get whipping, right? And uh, they need to know those things. And it's wrong to discipline a child for something that he had no concept of that was wrong. That's why God has all these 613 laws. I'm not going to judge you based on what you don't know. But here, he's telling them, I'll give you blessings and I'll give you curses. The blessing, if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today. The curse, if you do not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside from the way which I command you today to go after other gods which you have not known. Now it shall be when the Lord your God has brought you into the land which you go to possess, you shall put the blessing on Mount Gerizim and the curse on Mount Ebal. Are they not on the other side of the Jordan toward the setting sun? 
in the land of the Canaanites who dwell in the plain opposite Gilgal, beside the terebinth trees of Morah. You will cross over the Jordan and go in to possess the land which the Lord your God is giving you, and you'll possess it and dwell in it. You shall be careful to observe all the statutes and judgments which I set before you today. There are blessings that come from obedience, curses that come from disobedience. And when you get into the land, six of the tribes are going to stand on one mountain and recite the blessings. That's on Mount Gerizim. And six tribes are going to stand on Mount Ebal and will speak forth the curses. It's going to say, he who does so-and-so is going to be cursed, and he who does so-and-so is going to be cursed or blessed. He wants to make it simple and make it understandable. And that's why when you give rules and regulations to your children or employees, make sure they understand. Do you understand what I'm talking about? You understand the consequences, and then they go forward. And um, now he says in chapter 12, this is important for us, there's a right way to worship, and there's a wrong way to worship. Moses is going to give God's chosen way of worship, and that's going to be entailing, first of all, destroy the pagan worship centers that the Canaanites have had. I want you to worship at a single sanctuary of my choosing. And I also want you to offer only what I prescribe as a sacrifice. God's forbidden way of worship is going to involve avoiding all of the pagan practices. And so we must worship God in his chosen way, the only way, through Jesus Christ. Jesus makes two statements about that. One day he's at the well with the woman at the well, and she's asking, where is the right place to worship God? She says, uh, you Jews say in Jerusalem, and we say the Samaritans right here. And the Lord says there's going to come a day when they will worship God in spirit and in truth. You and I need to worship the God in spirit and in truth, the God of all creation. Truth, meaning by his revealed truth, and in the spiritual realm of our being, reaching out to his spirit. And Jesus again said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. So those are the standards that we have for worship today. What about in those days? Verse 12, or chapter 12 and verse 1. These are the statutes and judgments which you shall be careful to observe in the land which the Lord your God is giving all the days you live in the land. Utterly destroy all the places where the nations which you shall dispossess serve their gods, on the high mountains and the hills and under every green tree. You shall destroy their altars, break their sacred pillars, burn their wooden images with fire, cut down the carved images of their gods, and destroy their names from that place. You shall not worship the Lord your God with such things. You shall seek the place where the Lord your God chooses out of all your tribes to put his name for his dwelling place, and there you shall go. There you shall take your burnt offerings, sacrifices, tithes, heave offerings of your hand, vowed offerings, free will offerings, firstborn of your herds and flocks. And there you shall eat before the Lord your God. You'll rejoice in all to which you put your hand. You shall not at all do as we are doing here today, every man doing what's right in his own eyes. For as yet you have not come to the rest, the inheritance which the Lord your God is giving you. When you cross over the Jordan and dwell in the land which the Lord your God is giving you to inherit, he gives you rest from all your enemies round about so you may dwell in safety. When you go into this land of Canaan, which we know today as Israel, you're going to see all sorts of pagan places of worship. They were customarily on, gra on gra high ground. They thought that the gods and goddesses lived in the hills, by the trees, by the fertile green grass. And that's where they'd set up these altars. And they'd have all these kinds of physical pillars, um, wooden images with fire. Some of them were uh, the one to Asherah, the, the goddess of fertility, was a, a phallic symbol. And uh, there were other kinds of symbols as well to invoke the gods for fertility. We've talked before about how prostitution was basically a way to take the tithes and offerings in a pagan society. And uh, if you wanted to be blessed by the god, Baal, the fertility god or others, 
uh, then you would have sex with the temple priests, uh, the prostitutes, male or female, and you'd pay them the fee, and that sexual act, as well as your money, would be your way of supporting the temple and asking the God to bring fertility, bring us children, bring us crops, and what have you. It was a pagan way of worship, and God said you're going to destroy it. And I want your offerings and your sacrifices and tithes uh, not to go there, but to go the place I tell you to go to. I want you to eat before the Lord, verse 7, and rejoice that he's put... See, God wants to be a part of all of our lives, and especially the part of our worship. And um, he says, I want you to cross over. I want to give you rest, rest from your enemies. That word rest is picked up in Hebrews, where Joshua, it says, did not give them rest. Hebrews tells us that there is still a rest for the people of God. Quoting David, it says that today is the day of rest. And I understand that to be the Sabbath for the church. Not Saturday, which is the Sabbath for Israel before Jesus Christ came. Sunday is not the Sabbath, although I call it Sabbath rest. It's a celebration of the resurrection. But Hebrews 4 tells us that our rest is is in Jesus as we cease from our labors and allow him to carry out his work in us. Now maybe you carry two jobs or three jobs and maybe you get tired, but you should still be resting in Jesus knowing that Lord, you are the one who designs my activities, you impel me to do it, you create the opportunities to do it, you bless it and it's all for your glory. In any event, I do not want you to worship as the world does. Now today, you don't find too many of these Asherah poles around, I wouldn't think, or too many altars, but they are around. Right now I'm taking a young man to work who um, has to work in uh, a pizza place nearby, and he's struggling as a Christian with the environment because the owner allows one of the young men to blast his music so they all can hear it. And he says, Pastor Jerry, this is not... This is not rock and roll. This is not uh, edgy stuff. This is not uh, rap. This is definite lyrics worshiping Satan. I remember the days, Fred, in the early on, you were introducing us to backward masking, where there was a subliminal message, if you listen to music, even Christian music, that playing forward sounded great, and you played it backwards, and you'd hear, Satan is God, worship him. Those are the old days. That was 30 years ago. No more backward masking, or if it is, it's not necessary. It's right out there. It's right out there. And yeah, yeah a lot of stuff is loose and talking about sex and uh, etc. But we're talking about worshiping Satan and lyrics to that effect right out there in the open. I'm trying to work with this young man and praying as I drop him off to go on into this job. He's not a kid. He's 30 years of age, but he's struggling as a Christian in working in this environment. But he understands my father's late uh, father's statement here. The only thing that's worse than your job is... No job, so he's having to put up with this thing. <laughs> Kid has a habit of liking to eat, so I said, then you better keep working until God has something else there. Verse 4, uh, 11, there'll be a place where the Lord your God chooses to make his name abide. You'll bring all that I command you there. So I've got one place for you to worship, not on the high hills of the pagans, but I'm going to say burnt offerings you bring there, your sacrifices, your tithes, the heave offerings, that's a wave offering, all your choice offerings, the place that I tell you to. And you'll rejoice before the Lord your God, you and your sons and daughters, male and female servants, the Levite in your gates. Do not offer your burnt offerings in every place that you see. So you're not to go wherever you want and do whatever you want. You'll bring your sacrifices to me and the sacrifices that I prescribe. Today, all roads lead to God. There's only one God. We serve God wherever we want to serve him. And whatever I want to do, that's not the way. We come God's way through Jesus Christ. Now, that's necessary for salvation. Going to church is not necessary for salvation. But what does church offer? A sanctuary? A home? A church is many things, and I think about this almost daily. For some, it's a home, a family. For some, it's an emergency room or a crisis center. Uh, for some, it's uh, actually a means of uh, an expression of self-worth until they can really transfer to the self-worth in Jesus Christ. It can be many different things. 
But I like to think about the church as a family and an army to protect and to support so that the devil can't get to you. Because Paul said to one young man who was sinning, throw him out into the world and let the devil have at him. And when he learns his lesson, he'll come back. So if that's what you do to punish somebody by not letting him come to church, there are a lot of Christians out there who are punishing themselves by not getting involved with church. Well, there's so many hypocrites in the church, I don't want to go. We always have room for one more. Come on in, buddy. You know, don't worry about it. Come on in. We'll love you. In all sincerity, not hypocrisy either. Verse 20, the Lord your God enlarges your border as he promised you. Let me eat meat because you long to eat meat. You may eat as much meat as your heart desires. And um, if the place where the Lord your God chooses to put his name is too far from you, then you may slaughter your herd and your flock from the Lord, wherever the Lord is and, and eat it within your own gates. So the particular sacrifices that I'm calling for must be brought to my sanctuary, which will be eventually Jerusalem. But hey, you want to eat meat on your own? Then you can eat that at your own house, in your own gates. That's not a problem. And uh, you can slaughter it and whatever. But as far as my sacrifices, that is going to come in a certain place. Um, talking about the blood, verse 23, uh, you shall not eat the blood. The blood is sacred. The life is in the blood. Tell your doctor when you visit the doctor next time, doctor, don't bother taking doing any blood work, but tell me all you need to know about my body. And the doctor is going to say to you, I need the blood. I need some blood because that's where all the critical information is about how you're doing. And God says, do not eat the blood of an animal because it was his life and you respect the life and you respect God who gave that animal. So go to a restaurant and say, I want a steak with no juice in it and see what they have to say. In a kosher restaurant, they know what you're talking about. Otherwise, not so easily. Watch out for the false gods, verse 29. Uh, do not follow any false gods, verse 31. You'll not worship the Lord your God in that way. Every abomination to the Lord which he hates, they have done to their gods. They've burned their sons and daughters in the fire. God doesn't want that. King Solomon's going to set up a temple or a, uh, an image of Molech up on the Mount of Olives where they can burn their, their kids, burn their kids in order to get favor with the God. That God hates that. Be careful to observe what I've commanded you, verse 32. You shall not add to it nor take from it. So that's uh, a review of some of the important laws that God has for this new generation. For us, let's remember our salvation is not by our righteousness and not by our works, but by the righteousness and the work of Jesus Christ. What do we need to do to do the work of God? They asked Jesus. This is the work which God requires, that you believe on the Son of God whom he has sent. And with that in mind, I'd like to address those that don't know the Lord, especially if you're watching by television or video or by, by radio, you're listening to this. Do you know the Lord? Are you certain that you know him? And if you were to die today, do you know for an absolute certainty you'd go to be with him for eternity? If not, I'd like to pray with you and we'll cover all of us in this prayer. Just repeat this after me in your own hearts, wherever you are. Lord Jesus, I am a sinner and I repent of my sins. Wash me and cleanse me. Jesus, I believe you died for my sins. You are my Lord and my Savior and you have been raised from the dead. Live within me your glorious life. Amen and amen.